and now we're gonna sit here in silence. You're the <laughs> you can say hello. My name is Evan Reeves. I'm here with Sean and McGuire to discuss the following. Yeah, that's uh, the always the uh, the Zoom awkwardness, letting everybody shuffle in a little bit. But yes, <laughs> I am here with Sean and McGuire, famous author and filker, to discuss. Where it mires my mind, but I've been here all day. I'm sorry. Uh, productivity. It's no productivity during the pandemic. Because, you know, being cooped up in your house all day can do the toll on your motivation to get work done. So, Chandan, thank you very much for coming out and speaking with us. And, you know, I just kind of want to start out simply just with how you're doing, how you're holding up during the pandemic. And, you know, yeah, well, What's thank you for on? having me. I was really excited to be coming to WendyCon. I love Wendy. It's one of the conventions that I have gone to voluntarily when I wasn't a guest. And, um, you know, being a guest at a convention you really enjoy is even more of an honor than being a, a guest at a convention you've never heard of before. So I'm sorry that I'm not there with you and enjoying the state of Illinois where, you know, some of my favorite cheese shops are located. Uh, I do like cheese. Ooh, don't tell that to Wisconsin. Well, Wisconsin makes better cheese than Illinois does, honestly. Um, although right now, as far as I'm concerned, Iowa has both y'all beat. Oh, wow. Heresy. Farmhouse, yeah, I had a farmhouse cheddar in Iowa that was almost European quality. But... Um, Wisconsin, because they make so much cheese, they're almost, they almost take their cheese for granted. You know, someone just commented in the chat, we get our good cheese from Wisconsin, but we're close enough to import it. And, and that's very true because they have so much good cheese. They don't give a fuck. They don't <laughs> cheese shops. They don't set out to have a decent cheese monger. They're just like, no, all of our cheese is high quality. Why in the world would you need a cheese specialist? And then you come to Illinois where they don't have as much homemade cheese and you can find good cheesemongers who actually specialize in listening to you when you say what you like in cheese and matching it up with a cheese in their inventory. It's a little bit like the difference between asking someone who wrote an Amazon review once what they think you should be reading and asking a real librarian. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, it's so true. Well, I'll take the compliment on behalf of Illinois then on our cheese. But I am I am doing mostly okay. I am going slowly mad as I think we all kind of are. Um, this is the longest period in my adult life that I have been in one state, much less one city. You know, I see three people, two of whom live with me, one of whom is bubbled with me, and that's it. And my mother, uh, who does live in the house with me, thinks that this is a pandemic and uh, that it's all an attempt to defraud us of our freedoms. I don't understand at all how wearing a mask when you could kill me by breathing on me is destroying your freedom, but making me wear underpants when I don't want to is perfectly legal. You know, if you can go out without a mask, I should be able to go out stark ass naked and make y'all look at that. <laughs> I think I could get behind that. So like, kind of on that topic, if we could, if you can keep going in there. So family dynamics while you were, you know, sitting at home during a pandemic, how, how do you sort of navigate that minefield, especially when you have people who have, you know, such wildly different political beliefs? I mean, part of it does sadly come down to you don't want to be, you don't want to feel like you're complicit because you're being mm -hmm about things when they start going off, but you do have to ask yourself about your own safety when you are in a situation with them where you can't get away. If they start saying things that normally you would challenge, but you have no way to exit the house, to let them cool down, to throw them out of the house, I think a lot of silence and biting our tongues is going on right now, and that's terrible. Um, you know, that, that's not a great thing, but it is a situation that some of us are in. I have let things pass with my mom because I live with her. I'm not going to pick a fight when she can just come into my room at any time. 
but a panel that a, a manages a little more directly on panel topic is if you are in a creative field, if you're trying to write, you're trying to draw, you're trying to do anything that is sometimes dismissed as frivolous, you know, from my mother's perspective, again, we're going to pick on her a lot here because she does live with me. So she's one of the only people that I have to reference right now. The difference between me working and me fucking around on Tumblr is can she see my screen? So why shouldn't she come into my room anytime she wants to and start talking to me? Um, my method of working has always been, and this got me in trouble back when I had a day job because I would have to set things up with my manager. I don't want a 15 minute break once every two hours. I want a five minute break every 30 minutes. Hmm. And I'm spending that scrolling through Tumblr, maybe I'm spending it staring off into space, but she has an unerring talent for coming in during my five minute breaks and just deciding that I'm not working in here I'm avoiding doing other household things. And that's a pressure that especially women and female presenting people are getting more of during this pandemic, that if you're home all the time, why isn't your house spotless? If you have kids, why aren't you spending all your time on your kids? Why are you wasting time writing your little books? And that comes you know, societally, and part of it is ingrained. It gets beaten into us that if we have free time, we should have clean houses is not clean my house has not been clean in five years it does not smell funny and nothing is rotting so as far as i'm concerned i'm doing a real good job very nice very nice so kind of on that you sort of touch on this idea that you know now that you're you know surrounded by your family so much and they're seeing some more of your creative process they don't quite understand everything that goes into it you know something that seems you know frivolous or stupid is actually, you know, important to your work. So how do you navigate that, that sort of that idea that people are, you know, kind of seeing more of what you're doing without really having understood it beforehand and maybe not quite getting, you know, the process that you go through? Part of it is enforcing a lot of boundaries. You know, um, I will sometimes just not respond. I will keep my back to the door and go, sorry, working, you got to go. Uh, part of it is a little bit defensive because if you were to come and spend an entire day standing in front of my closet staring creepily while I worked, you would see Tumblr and you would see Flight Rising, which is a clicky game where you breed virtual dragons. You would see a lot of stuff that is not necessarily directly work. But in a creative field or in any kind of field uh, that involves thought to actually achieve your job. If you're a coder, if you're somebody that creates anything, you do sometimes have to stop and think. And for me, stopping and thinking frequently takes the form of clicking virtual dragons. If I don't do that, I don't work as well. So I get very defensive about this is, this is actually my process. This is how my time works. You are in my space, get the fuck out of my space. Mm -hmm. Setting boundaries. I think that's just something people need to work on in general. Not just setting them. I think we all have we all have a decent sense of I am an autonomous creature. I have not met very many people that cannot say to some degree, don't touch me or leave me alone. Um, but I think accepting boundaries is a skill we need to work on harder especially if you're not a straight, white, able-bodied, vaguely Christian male, not even extremely Christian, just vaguely Christian, if you don't hit what we call the genericism trifecta, saying no to people can get you branded as cruel, can get you pushed back on as being really, really nasty or rude. I have worked with my therapist. I love my therapist. She's why I'm even halfway sane at this point, but I've worked with her on getting better at saying no, because people's reaction to my saying no is frequently disproportionate enough that it becomes harder to say the next no. If you're afraid of being branded a bitch because you said, I'm sorry, I don't want to do that, you're not going to accept the thing that could get you the brand. So I do think that we need to not only work on setting boundaries, we need to work on allowing other people to set boundaries without taking it personally. 
and being direct and open about the things we can't do. Like I've had to start telling conventions and conferences that I speak at during the pandemic via Zoom, I'm going to swear more, I'm sorry. I try not to, but I'm in my house, my cats are on my feet, I haven't left the house in months, going a little stir crazy, my language is a little salty, I will try to respect whatever rating you put on me, but I'm gonna slip up. And if that is a deal breaker, then I need to go. And that's not me flouncing, that's me saying I have a realistic boundary, I have a point past which I can't make promises. All right, just so you know, we don't give a shit, so don't worry. Oh, I know, I've been to WindyCon. <laughs> But, you know, that's a really interesting point you bring up about, uh, you know, respecting boundaries, because I always hear that, you know, the problem that we have, especially in American society, is that people have a hard time communicating. But it really sounds like the problem is that people aren't listening. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they want to wait until they hear something, you know, that that's what they want to hear and then they respond to that. And if they don't, they're going to keep pushing. So I guess along those lines, my question would be, so how, what do you have to do in order to get people to respect, you know, the boundaries that you're having and that you're setting and the message that you're putting out there? I had to accept on some level, which is still difficult for me, that no matter what I do, not everyone is going to like me. I can be the nicest, sweetest, mildest, most reserved version of myself. I can be Janet from The Good Place walking around a convention, and there will still be people who do not like me. And that's really difficult. I want even the people I hate to like me because I have that very beat down, smartest kid in class, got shoved into lockers, rejection fear. Mm -hmm. um, and once you accept on some level that, you know what? You're Evan, you don't like me. You're still gonna be professional. We can still work together, but you wouldn't hang out with me socially. And I'm okay with that. Once you accept that, it gets a little bit easier to say no because part of the difficulty in saying no is the fear of being disliked. And the reason that Americans, um, American society especially, it's not just us, but it's everybody, um, the reason that Americans can get away with saying I didn't hear it is that we prevaricate. We don't say no. We say, you know, I'm not really sure that I have the time. I don't think it's a good idea right now. Uh, you, you get waffly, mm -hmm. and kind of talk around things. And when you're trying to stay productive and trying to stay creative during a situation like this, you have to get a lot blunter. No, mm -hmm. I will not do that. No, I cannot do that no, that does not fit into my plan for this week. Mm -hmm. Very good. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and sort of talk about inspiration because everybody's cooped up at home. You're not able to get out there. You're not seeing as much. You're not able to experience as much. You know, how do you, how, how do you get that muse when you're, you're stuck at your home? You're scroll, you know, doom scrolling on Twitter all day. If you need to wait for a muse to show up, you're never going to be a professional writer because you won't be able to work to deadline. Mm hmm so this, my current fidget, is a Generation 1 My Little Pony. I have been collecting these since I was four years old. The entire October Day series is basically a novelization of my childhood game of My Little Pony. I still have ponies. I have an entire bedroom full of My Little Ponies. They've got their own room. It's across the hall from this one. If I really need inspiration, I just go in there and start moving ponies around. And the part of your brain that when you're four or five and you are just high as fuck all the time on brain chemicals when compared to an adult mm -hmm. actually is like a, a neurological thing. When a four or five year old says, my doll had a conversation with me, they're not confessing to mental illness. They are having a, my brain works like a four year old. Mm -hmm. You remember my ponies doing stuff on their own when I was very small, and that doesn't happen anymore, for which I am very thankful. I would have, to <laughs> but you know, I can go in there and set up the play sets and move them around, and it will eventually start turning on that part of my brain that learned very early that playing with toys is inspiring and it helps you with things. D and D is also a big help. 
you know, everything we do is at least a little bit derivative of the lives we leave, lead. I'm expecting a big wave of pandemic fiction that will make me very angry. <laughs> um, and I say very angry because I love pandemic fiction. I love books about horrible diseases so much. It's been really awful because a lot of my comfort reads, the things that I'm like, I feel bad. I'm going to read something to make me feel better are books about diseases. Mm -hmm. I reread The Stand more than 50 times. And that book is a commitment. Mm -hmm. But the ones that don't make the reread lists are the ones where the virology are bad, is bad where they don't understand how a disease works, where they say things like, oh, you know, if you pour it around them for 15 minutes, you're fine. Um, or masks are impinging on our freedom or whatever. And this can make me dislike books that everyone else adores. You know, I, I really genuinely dislike, and I'm not shy about my dislike, uh, World War Z by Max Brooks, which is considered a classic of our mutual genre, the zombie fiction, you know. Um, but the virology in World War Z is so unrealistic that the second the doctors show up, I am knocked out of that book. I can't read anymore. I'm, and I'm expecting a lot of fiction inspired by I survived a pandemic where they will have done no research. They will not have been able to find any doctors that actually want to talk to them and answer their question because our doctors are burned out. They're tired. They don't want to have this conversation. And so they're just writing it based on what articles their doom scroll Twitter fed up to them. Um, so that's going to be really depressing. It's, it's kind of awful when your favorite stuff becomes really big, but it becomes really big in a really irritating way. Mm -hmm. That was me in the It movie. You know. Right, right. Yeah, I think everybody has that thing where, you know, everybody gets on the bandwagon and then what you like changes and then it's just not cool anymore because it loses the thing that you loved about it. It's still cool, but, you know, I I periodically have to be physically removed from the presence of bronies because mm -hmm. I will just start yelling. Yeah. The fact that once we got a male audience for My Little Pony, they actually read My Little Pony to appeal more to that audience. But when a male property gets a female audience, they cancel the property. Was just offensive in ways I don't have words for. Mm -hmm. Completely understandable. Completely understandable. So uh, kind of going back to that point about, you know, setting the deadlines and whatnot, how do, does your does your process sort of workflow change now that you're cooped up at home? Or are you still, uh, you know, maintaining the same deadlines? You know, the, the same uh, same process that you're using, even if you know we weren't stuck at home right now. As this has drawn on, I have slowed down. Um, I am only mortal, mm -hmm. and I am still maintaining a high enough daily word count to hit my deadlines because that is how I pay my power bill. Mm -hmm. um, if you are not yet publishing professionally or if you are publishing professionally but you're not doing it as a primary source of income, I hugely recommend setting artificial deadlines for yourself. Figure out what your comfortable daily cruising speed is. I can write 100 words a day. I can write 500 words a day. I can write 1,000 words a day. We're not expecting you to write every single day, which is why I'm saying find your comfortable speed, not your best speed then write out a deadline for yourself and go, okay, I can comfortably write 500 words a day and I need to finish an 8,000 word short story. I am going to say that I will have a first draft of that 8,000 word short story 18 days from the time that I open and create the file. And then if you have a really good day, if you work ahead of your 500 words, you get bonus words to create a buffer. Most of the time I can shave about a week off my projected completion time by just working a little bit faster and having good days. Don't set deadlines if you're doing it arbitrarily that you can't meet. That will just make you feel like you're failing, but it will motivate you to act finish things. And not having that outside pressure means that you can just masturbate forever. You know, 
what's great is not having written is not writing it's having written and it's thinking about writing and it's the anticipation of writing because the story will never ever ever be as good as it was when it was just in your head mm -hmm. i've won hugo awards i've been nominated for a lot of hugos that i've lost and in none of those cases was the book that you could pick up and read as good as the book that was in my head and in fact, I've improved some of those books because that's part of how I go to sleep at night is I'll lay there and revise the story to make it better. Like it's published. You can't fix it. You can't change it. Why are you doing this to yourself? I'm going to make it better. Like, okay, cool. Cool. There's something profoundly wrong with you. <laughs> uh, if only we could go to the borders in your head. So there is still a borders open in my head. Because I loved Borders. Yeah, no, I'm kind of sad. I, I think I even lost a Barnes and Noble out here, so I don't have any physical bookstores around. So, so I guess a, a quick question. So then, uh, have any deadlines from your editors or publishers? Have those all stayed the same? Have they, you know, changed? Have they pushed those back, pushed them forward? Or what's been fun is they have stayed the same, and I say fun because finishing a story, a book, a comic script, whatever is only part of the story. Mm -hmm. you now, if I, so I have a book that is due December 1st. It's the next October day book. It's called When Sorrows Come. It is done. I finished draft one of that book on October 6th. I busted my ass and got it done a full month ahead of my projected completion time because I wanted to give my beta readers and editors time to go through it before the election. Mm -hmm. So I sent that out to all of my first readers and my agent who actually gets paid to do this in early October. I heard back from no one. Mm. The book is still due December 1st. And when I ask about that, um, when I try to poke people, I get, oh, the pandemic, there's so much stress. Oh, the election, there's so much stress. Oh, the everything, there's so much stress. That is true, but I am living through that too. Like, I don't have a get out of pandemic free card because mm -hmm. I'm a number. Um, So no, there has been no leeway built into our deadlines. As far as I'm aware, unless you are actually pushing a book out by like a year, which I know some people have done, you are still expected to finish the work have the work sufficiently revised and edited to be turned in and turn the work in according to the originally contracted dates. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way I pay my bills. So I'm not going to fuck around and find out. That's not my job. Fair enough. Well, very, very target. difficult to continue convincing myself that telling silly stories is an important thing right now. Yeah, no, that's a, uh... Honestly, that's kind of where I was even helping to throw this convention. Like, mm -hmm. had I known or realized how close to the election we were, I probably would have delayed this by a couple of weeks. But uh, here we are and everything's running great, I hope so. Yeah, things seem to be pretty smooth. I'm enjoying watching the chat scroll. People are chatting a little bit nice. um, and we have nothing in the Q&A yet. So we're nice. doing and yes, and please, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in Q&A or you can even put them into the chat and I'll find them. I have it open here on the side, but you know, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, if uh, there's just two of us, we need yeah. people to ask questions for us to actually have things to say. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just I pulling did, questions out of my ass here. I'm not yeah, a writer. I did a panel earlier this week that asked me, how many My Little Ponies do you have on your desk? And then followed that up with, can we see them? And I'm like, well, that is, no one is going to believe me that I didn't pay you to do that. So. Are you saying that you want me to ask you how many My Little Ponies you have? No, there's, they're buried under stuff. I don't actually know, but that was just a, well, okay, you keep saying that this is a thing. How many, how many is a thing? Can we see them? Like, are you trying to make me prove that my desk is covered in ponies? What's the gel? What's the gig here? Like, I don't know. <laughs> People are strange. Yeah, yeah. That's what makes it wonderful. Yep. I do honestly appreciate how um, 
everyone's kind of Marie kondo their life a little bit. Mm-hmm. Marie Kondo is, as far as I'm concerned, the best of the organiza- organizers, even if her system as a whole doesn't work for you. Because her thing is not get rid of your weird shit. Her thing is embrace the shit that makes you happy. Mm-hmm. Like, she would have no issues with my pony room. My ponies are contained. There are a bunch on the desk because they're in intake. But for the most part, the ponies have a place to live. They, they have an organizational system. And they spark joy. They spark so much joy. My dirty laundry does not spark joy. I should probably pick that up and wash it at some point. And watching everyone kind of as much as they can, because there's been no pandemic relief, so that's super fun. But as much as they can going, you know what? Talking to you does not spark joy. Watching propaganda shows on NBC does not spark joy. Like, whatever. I'm going to do the things that make me happy, and I'm going to stop worrying about whether they look grown up and mature. And that is driving ebook sales. So, yay. <laughs> um, although, you know, we are, we are supposedly and primarily talking about productivity during the pandemic here. So, one thing I would like folks to remember however you read is perfect. If you read physical books, you know, if, if this is your gig, that's perfect. If you read electronic books, that's perfect. If you read audiobooks, that's perfect. Whatever allows you to intake stories to keep escaping a little bit and keep your own brain fed enough that it doesn't start eating you. Nothing I'm about to say is criticizing the specific way anyone reads, but without the ability to go to our independent bookstores and browse and look at things and put our hands on the books, a lot of us are falling more and more into eBooks. We're seeing huge surges in eBook sales, which is great for me, but we are seeing a commiserate drop off in physical book sales, which is bad for all of us. It is not good if Amazon becomes the only bookstore because we didn't support our independent bookstores through this situation. That is actively bad. So um, we were talking about borders a little bit. I made the New York Times list with book three of the October Day series and with Mm. book five. Book four was not somehow uniquely terrible Book four was released a week before Borders closed down. There physically were not enough copies of book four in circulation without the Borders order to make the times list. So it does impact authors. And if you impact authors enough, we stop publishing and then your options narrow. Amazon has already shown a tendency to delist, deprioritize, and hide things that they don't like. So if you're writing queer romance, that may not show up on the Amazon search results page unless somebody knows your specific title and and name. Please, as you're reading through this pandemic, you know, support your local libraries if they have a lending system. But if you're buying books for yourself, consider picking up a physical book once in a while. Consider ordering from your local independent because we got to use them or we're going to lose them. And if we lose them, they're not coming back. You know, that's a really interesting parallel I can draw us because we're seeing the same thing in the video game world. You know, physical mm-hmm. copies are way, way down right now. Digital copies are up. And you know, like, you know, the big corporations, they don't care. They're getting their money anyway. And the really, really tiny independents are doing okay because, you know, it helps with their visibility and they're only releasing digital anyway. But those groups in the middle, you know, where they're big enough to where they can release on physical, but, you know, they also are in digital are kind of getting lost in the middle and you know, there's a lot of worry for those sort of middle, you know, guys who are trying to come up as well as, you know, the fact that it's going to be harder to preserve these things, you know, when they're stuck on some system and they won't move forward. So it's just kind of interesting that you see that sort of parallel and the same problem across different types of media. I mean, we like ease. You know, uh, there is a new Dungeons and Dragons book coming out on Tuesday, which anyone who has spoken to me in the last month has heard about more than they wanted to. <laughs> Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and it's mm-hmm. the first big update in about five years. So right. we've got new sub races, we've got new subclasses, we've just got this beautiful expansion of what is possible within the game world. And uh, it comes out Tuesday. I have ordered my physical copy from a local gaming store. 
I probably won't get that physical copy till Wednesday. We've also bought it on D&D Beyond virtually. And I would be a lot fussier about the fact that I'm not going to get my physical book on Tuesday, if not for the fact that I'll be able to access my virtual book on Tuesday. We all want to be at the front of the line. We want to be playing the video game while it still has mysteries in it. We want to be reading the book while it still has surprises. You know, I am that jerky kid. Oh my God, oh my God, did you see what's going on on page 17 of Tasha's? These new magic items are great, oh my God. Um, but I still want to have that experience for myself. And I think that is feeding into just about everything that has both digital and physical delivery, especially once they started playing silly buggers with the post office. Mm -hmm. If I can't trust that a package from anyone other than Amazon is gonna reach me, why would I buy that way? So, so let me ask you this, because there's another thing that I've been seeing uh, mostly from some of my twins, friends on Twitter when it comes to feeling obligated to work more. You know, you're stuck at home. You don't have many distractions. You know, you feel like you have to be more productive. You have all this time. And then when you're not working hard, you know, twice, three times as hard as you could be, you start to feel bad. You know, what, what do you say to somebody who's sort of dealing with that? Hello, my name is Seanan McGuire. I have won every award that I set out to win when I was a small child who thought that science fiction was the greatest community in the universe. I am an internationally best-selling author available in more than 15 languages. And when somebody asks, oh, can I buy your book at a bookstore? I can say that that bookstore has probably paid to have me come and speak there. And I am giving you full and complete permission to lay on your couch and watch an entire season of Top Chef in one session if that's what makes you happy. Thank you. Thank you. We're probably going to clip that one just so that you can share it all around the world because people need to hear that. I have the irritated word. the closed captioning system. It's kind of great. That's right. It's all right. It's all right. Speak the gospel. But no, seriously, it's back to that whole you're expected to have your house clean because cleaning is a form of productivity. That is work. Anything that is work, childcare, cleaning, cooking, it's all feeding into productivity. And we feel like we have so much extra time right now. We still have the same number of hours in the day and we are under such an extreme degree of communal stress. Even if your life is completely perfect, you are independently wealthy, your family has like millions of dollars, you know that the power is not gonna get cut off. You are able to completely bubble yourself and don't have to worry that you're gonna get sick. There is the constant fear right now that the pandemic is going to find its way into your home. The Mask of the Red Death is going to play out in real time. Your publisher is going to close. Your favorite video game company is going to fold. The police are still being dicks. You know, we've got, what, 67, 66 more days of Trump in the White House. And even if you are a massive Trump supporter, you know, he's throwing fits that are undermining the continuancy of our democracy, saying that suddenly this election is the first crooked election we've ever had. There's no evidence that this is actually a bad election, but he's being allowed to say these things. His, his uh, staffers are being allowed to imply that they're not going to accept the outcome of the election. And that's terrifying. We are under so much stress that we are actually aging at a faster rate. This is going to leave marks on us socially, mentally, and psychologically for decades, if not forever. You can't be expected to behave or perform at a level of top productivity under that sort of stress. It's genuinely impossible. And if you could do it, you would be Hill House. Mm -hmm. You would be existing under such conditions of absolute sanity that you actually went mad. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you brought that up because I, I did want to ask about, you know, fear, stress, and anxiety and, you know, how that plays into trying to get any work done. I mean, and I, we kind of touched on it before where, you know, everything that we're doing just feels kind of trivial with, you know, the complete shit show that's around us right now. But, you know, how do you, how do you live with that fear, you know, that, that anxiety and still, you know, go through and get the work done that you need to get done. 
much. I remind myself that I like being homeless even less than I like being stressed because for me, the work is all that keeps the power on. You know, my mother lives with me. She doesn't pay rent. I am the sole support of this household. And we are fickle. We are fickle creatures. We like what comes out regularly. If you miss a deadline and your book gets pushed back, you not only don't get paid for that book, your royalties probably go down everywhere else. But in terms of more helpful, actionable advice, you know, we're back to Marie Kondo a little bit. Find a thing that makes you happy and surround yourself with it. I love My Little Ponies and I love dice. My desk is covered in My Little Ponies and it's covered in dice. I like to look around and see things that make me feel better. And yes, it's trivial and yes, it's frivolous and no, it's not going to matter and it's not going to protect me from COVID. I can't make a wall of D6s no matter how hard I try, but it gives me something to hold on to. And it gives you a little bit of an anchor of joy. Like if your serotonin has to come from $10 a pop acrylic dice sets, that's okay. Hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, we're at what, like the uh, 13 minute mark. I just want to make sure if anybody had any questions that they yeah, wanted to submit. please ask us questions. Yeah. Nobody, you're going to make me make it, come up with some more questions panel? All right. All right, that's cool. So dice are actually a magic productivity tool. Um, you know, again, figure out what your cruising speed is and it's different for everyone. I've known people that wrote successful books, did successful series at a hundred words a day on average. Mm -hmm. they write every single day, but if you divided their days, it came out to about a hundred words. Then you've got like Charlie Strauss, whose cruising speed is about 4,000 words a day because there is something profoundly wrong with him. Find out what your specific cruising speed is and find the size of dice that closely, most closely aligns with it. And this is a, this is a D10, it's a gaming die, but these are all part of a standard seven dice set. And so what I'll do is when I get up in the morning, if I need to write a thousand words before I can go play Overwatch and scream at 11 year olds, I will set the die to 10 and just put it on the corner of my keyboard. And every time I write 100 words, I iterate the die so that the number always tells me how many words I have left to go in today's assignment. If I have to do 2,000, then I'll just get to, to one and then reset to 10 and keep going. But I find that if I have a die on my keyboard, I work better and faster and more consistently to the word count I have set because it's not just nebulous. It's a physical thing. And you get a little victory. I get to turn the die now. It's great. Um, again, you get your serotonin where you can find it. Mm -hmm. I don't actually recommend using D20s, even if you're somehow working in increments of 2,000 because you spend too long looking for the next number. You get a nice like D100. It's basically a ball. It just sort of rolls on the palm. Yeah, that's true. And you never find the number you need. You want. <laughs> Um, Uncle Vlad asks, how do you think we as a, a fandom transition back to whatever the new normal is going to be post COVID? You know, I think part of it is we have to collectively both decide and come to terms with what that new normal will be. I did a convention a couple years ago where the con chair walked through the, of the space with me before the con actually started just walking around going, this is where this is, this is where that is, this is where this is. And that part was actually really nice. Like I appreciated knowing as a first time guest in their hotel space where I could go to find things. A lot of cons just drop you in even as one of the guests and expect you just to navigate without any sense of things. But as we're finishing, he says, and that's the bar. I hope you'll be one of our friendly guests. And I said, what do you mean? And he says, well, some guests will hang out in the bar until 3 a.m. talking to readers. And he proceeds to rattle off a list of names and all the names are dudes. And then mm. he's, some of our guests, as soon as they're done with programming, they run off to their room. And then he rattles off another list of names and they're all ladies. Mm. People, people have historically felt like they were allowed to touch me. Like the fact that I was a guest of honor meant I was public property. And I don't always just mean I want a handshake. I mean hugging me without warning, coming up behind me, draping their arms around me. I've never met these people before. I'm still a person. 
I still get to have a no-no zone and it's my entire goddamn body. So I do hope that we as a fandom will transition to having a little more respect for the space and needs of others. You know, I would be perfectly happy to have the six foot zone maintained. On my side of the table, I'll be, I'm happy to talk to people. I'm not unfriendly. I like people. I just don't like being touched. Mm -hmm. And I also don't, back to that whole setting boundaries thing. If you are a female guest and you say, I'm sorry, I don't want to hug you. I'm sorry, I don't want you touching me. Why did you just follow me into the women's bathroom? Which actually happened. You're the one that's unfriendly. You're the one that's somehow crossing a line. And it's why a lot of the female authors who travel with big dudes. I actually have an act which includes a couple folks from the from the Chicago area who were really excited to be at WindyCon with me. But it's not because I'm afraid for my life or I think I'm going to be snatched out of my hotel room. It's because I need to have a barricade or people will just fucking touch me. And I don't want that. So I hope that we transition to giving each other a tiny bit more space. Hi, Scotty. My security team showed up here. Yay. I see they're on it. Yep, they're on it. They're in chat. Yes. Um, so, you know, if we all give each other a little more space and don't act like other people's bodies are part of con space, that would be great. And that extends to not messing with wheelchairs, not interacting with service dogs, not crowding up so much that we're right on top of each other. Um, I think that we're going to have a lot more hand sanitizer stations. Uh, but also... I would like to see a certain measure of the virtual continue because back in March, when we were all just starting to talk about the shutdown, we're all just starting to talk about, no, this isn't going to happen. Emerald City Comic Con is my local big media convention. Uh -huh. There was a lot of discussion about is Emerald City going to go forward or is it going to cancel because it's early April normally. And we had people on the Facebook group and on the Twitter threads and all of that saying, even if I'm sick, I will go. That convention is my thing. I will show up no matter what. And I feel like FOMO is a big thing with fans. Right. Have that active fear of missing out. And that means that right now we will show up sick. And that's part of why con crud is such a mythological thing. But we had the WISCON where everybody got sick, packed around like a ball. And if we stay a little bit virtual, then maybe people will stay home. Because I would honestly like to avoid the world where we have temperature checks at the hotel doorway for the rest of time. And that, to a certain degree, assumes that that's not where society winds up going. But... It is a concern of mine, not a huge concern, but a concern that if fans don't, and I include myself in the word fans there, but if fans don't chill out a little bit about the fear of missing out, we're going to keep triggering lockdowns. And that applies to too. I did a convention a couple of years ago where Gary Wolf was one of the guests. He had a literal heart attack and showed up back at the con the next day because he was afraid of seeming ungrateful or rude if he didn't come and take care of his responsibilities. And I'm not saying that guests should cancel because they wake up grumpy. I'm saying that if a guest feels unwell, we should not socially punish them for staying home rather than, oh my God, I caught Stephen King's cold. I don't want Stephen King's cold. All right. Very good points. Very good points. I want to read a comment that we actually got through the Q&A from uh, Cassie Beach. No question, but I wanted to let Shauna know that her Twitter feed helps get me through the pandemic. Her genuine joy in dice sets and ponies is contagious and makes stress easier to cope with. So thank you, Shauna. You are very welcome. I still have to take today's daily Tinkerbell picture, um, which is going to happen when we're done here. Uh, Tinkerbell is my mother's 10 month old, eight month old, eight month old, gosh, don't add more months to her life, is my mother's eight month old ragdoll kitten. 
and we have done the daily Tinkerbell project where I have managed a picture of Tinkerbell every single day since we picked her up. Um, and she is one of the most photogenic cats I have ever known. She's adorable. Uh, but the cat pictures are an important thing. Tink, come here, come here, come here, baby. Come here and show yourself to Zoom or don't. <laughs> Back to cat. Yeah, the cats are like that. <laughs> But I'm really glad to help. It's kind of the goal there. We have one more in the Q&A. Yes. What, if anything, will we learn from this pandemic that we'll remember for the next one? Because there will be a next one. So I'm going to go ahead and say absolutely nothing. Nothing that we're learning right now is actually new. Nothing that we're learning right now is novel. The disease is novel, but the lessons are not. You know, we had the wear a mask in public lesson in 1918. We have had the, if I get sick and care, I will make everyone around me sick lesson again and again and again. I was born the same year that we eradicated smallpox. And when I was a kid, I would read about this and just think, oh my gosh, it's so amazing that I live in a world where I'm never going to have smallpox because science wins and we like vaccines and we understand the science. And then we immediately forgot it. Measles kills children. Chicken pox can kill children and it more frequently kills adults and older people. Whooping cough kills everyone. We have proven usable vaccines for these diseases. And yes, vaccine damage is a thing when you're talking about literally anything that you give to millions of people, someone is going to have a bad reaction. I'm sure that Evan, because he is a reasonable person who enjoys things, probably likes a nice mango once in a while. Who doesn't? I don't, because I would die. Oh, well. So, you know, the vaccine damage in this case is me and Mango. Mm -hmm. But one person in three million versus the number of children who would die annually if we stopped vaccinating against all once common childhood diseases is it's not even a number. You know, the, the odds there are so slanted in favor of you vaccinate your goddamn children. And somehow this is a conversation we're having. Somehow this is a debate. Somehow you will get people arguing and saying in absolute sincerity that smallpox never killed anyone. That these things never hurt anybody. The fact that smallpox killed as many people as it did is proof that white people don't listen, which is kind of fun. Uh, because we had smallpox variolation along the Ivory Coast for literally centuries before Zebediah Boylston in Boston or Lady Mary Wortley in England listened to the people who were telling them, hey, maybe do this and we'll live. But we don't learn. We don't want to learn. We have such a stretch of anti-intellectualism running through our culture and such a short communal memory that we're not gonna remember anything. I guarantee you that if we clear up this pandemic completely, COVID actually goes away on January 1st, 2021, which is not gonna happen, but COVID goes away and it's over on January 8th, 2021, we will have the convention where somebody licks their hand and then shakes hands with a guest. Which I have seen happen. Mm -hmm. So we are at 5.50, which is time for us. Thank you all for, for hanging out and being here with us today. Um, I know it's a little odd doing our conventions this way, but it's still really nice to not actually see you. <laughs> It'd be nicer to see you, but then your Zoom meeting is so confusing. It's like 90 people and one dude's naked and doing the baby elephant dance. It's never fun. Right, right. Yeah, I agree. So with that, I want to thank you again, Shannon, for coming out imparting your wisdom in only the way that you can. Um, that is going to conclude our programming for this evening, but you know, th thank you for coming out and uh, I'm done talking for the night. <laughs> Good plan. Thank you for having me y'all get some sleep. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>